Welcome to Cafe Scientifique, Silicon Valley at SRI International. I am Marty Ritchie from our corporate communications group here at SRI, and I produce our cafe events. Um, I'd like to welcome all the newcomers here tonight as well as our regulars. Um, and as a reminder, if you've missed a past event or would like to share tonight's event once it's available on video, please visit our YouTube channel. Uh, the bookmarks that you might have picked up on the way in or you could pick up on the way out will have the URL for that. Um, one little housekeeping note, there will be no event in April, so we will see you again in May when we're going to have Sven Biker from Stanford talking about the future of automobiles, you know, electric car, driverless cars, all that kind of stuff, so that should be good. Um, but tonight we are pleased to welcome marine biologist Nicole Crane back to the cafe. Nicole is a project leader for the Ulithi Marine Management and Conservation Project. She focuses on outer island communities to help this with sustainable ocean management planning. And she last spoke with us back in January 2012 about her work. Nicole is a faculty member at, in the biology department at Cabrillo College and also a senior conservation scientist at the Oceanic Society. She has more than 20 years of experience working with communities and conducting ecological assessments of reefs. She is dedicated to linking rigorous science with cultural knowledge and community leadership in conservation. Without further ado, please welcome Nicole Crane back to the podium. Thank you. OK, can you all hear me OK? All right. So. I just, uh, just finished giving a talk in which I had to condense all of this work down to 10 minutes. So I think we'll, we'll be done in about 11 minutes. So, <laughs> um, so I, I did add a few more things so that I could expand a bit on, on some of this. But if I'm going too fast or saying something that you need clarification on, please feel free to let me know that. Okay. So I'm going to talk um, tonight about work that we're doing in the outer islands of Yap State in Micronesia. And I'm going to start off by sort of setting the stage and talking a bit about what conservation is. So I'm really going to try to put this work into a broader context of what conservation means and how conservation is moving forward in, in the world today. And then I'm going to get into kind of what pristine means. I'm going to give you some graphs about sea turtles, but you know, I promise I'm not going to try to make the graphs boring. I'll just show them quickly. And what it means to have increasing populations of, for example, some endangered animal of some sort. Then I'm going to introduce my team on the slides. They're not all here. And then we'll go to Yap on the slides. And maybe you can go there too. I'll tell you about an opportunity to do that if you're interested. And we'll talk a bit about the traditional customs and practices in Yap. It's a very traditional place. And then we'll get into some data that we're collecting and what we're doing with those data. So how we're working with communities to, uh, to work those data into their management plans. So we'll start off here with. Um, kind of what conservation is. And for many people, these are the kinds of pictures that grace, well, actually they grace our computer screens, right, too, like oceans and a lot of watery stuff. Um, these are sort of the images that make us think about beautiful oceans. It might make us feel like protecting beautiful oceans, which is why they're used a lot in brochures to ask you to help protect beautiful oceans. And you might think that in order to protect beautiful oceans, you would need to set them aside or at least areas in the oceans aside, from exploitative human use and keeping people out of the picture so we can protect the animals that live there. And you'd be right, because those methods do work. But to a Micronesian outer islander, a healthy ocean might look more like this. So it might look more like a catch of fish that they would land at the end of an hour or two of fishing, fish with which they will feed their families and support their communities, which they've been doing on some of these outer islands for a very, very long time. In fact, on the island of Lamatrek, archaeological evidence has shown that people have been there for 4,000 years, at least. So some of them uh, have been populated for a very long time with people. So the question then is, what is a pristine system? And this is a really important question because it drives conservation. How, how do we decide at what state we want our ocean in? Does it look like this? Does it look like something else? Does it have lots of sharks swimming around in it? Does it have lots of fish swimming around in it? So what does it look like? And that's a tricky question, because there's something called a shifting baseline, which we'll get into in just a second, which really is all about what is the benchmark? Is it when I started my career? Is it when you first went snorkeling somewhere? Is it 1,000 years ago? So what is the baseline? 
And here's a, uh, some graphs here about, uh, um, this is a green sea turtle. Okay, the, the ultimate charismatic megafauna here, this cute little turtle. Right away loves sea turtles because they have watery eyes and they're so sweet looking. So here are some graphs that, that sort of show sea turtle recovery. Okay, so if you look over here, you see this nice upswing and then a blue line here. And these, uh, this blue line here shows uh, the place at which um, uh, the, the delisting goal, if you see that word, delisting goal. So this, this word, this is kind of a, it's an important word in policy, and it means this is the population level at which we can take them off the endangered species list, or off the critical list, or off the red list, or whatever list they're on. We can delist them. And that then lifts a whole bunch of regulations, which means that fishermen will not get fined as much. I mean, it's an important place, right? So how do we come up with those, those levels? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it's actually a little bit arbitrary because it's all in context. Okay, so some of you might be statisticians. Yeah. Regarding context, I see you mentioned Australia, Florida, and of course these islands. So do you consider the whole world population or the local population? The so that's kind of, a, that's, like the, that's like the million dollar question. So he's saying, do you consider the whole world population or a regional population? Or what is the, what is the population you consider? Well, normally we do this regionally because it's really hard to get access to world data. This is a slippery number. We don't really have a lot of the information, even where green sea turtles nest. So that's a really important point, because this is showing you a population. Um, this is Atlantic green sea turtle. Here's showing you a population in Australia, right? So these are specific populations. And I want you to notice the, the noise in these graphs, and this means the up and down, right? These graphs are going like this. So you want to get a nice line. Well, there's kind of a joke in in ecology that with statistics, with whatever program you can buy, you can fit a line to like pretty much anything if you work hard enough at it, right? So, and you can fit your lines to look really nice, you know, like a nice little upswing here, right? That looks good. Whoop, look at that. It's good. So whatever we're doing out there with green sea turtles must be good. Um, but I want you to take a look at this lower graph here on the lower left. And that's showing you, that's now stepping way back about uh, to green sea turtles historically. And you look how incredibly abundant they were uh, many, many years ago. Then they took this precipitous decline in the 17th and 18th centuries, and now they're beginning to increase. But you know what? The present populations are barely higher than the noise. <laughs> if you take the noise out of the data from historic records, it's like barely a blip, really. So how do we mark then when we delist these things? What do we consider recovered and pristine and healthy based on the last 10 years, 20 years, 100 years? So my point with these set of graphs is to show you that it's not easy to figure that out, and especially in the ocean where things can be very difficult to access. So then the next question is when we're recovering reef systems, what do we consider a recovered system? So this, this uh, image here on the left would be a healthy reef and the arrow pointing to the right would be a degraded reef. So we know that a lot of our coral reefs are, are declining today. And I'm not going to stand up here and give you all the statistics about the declining coral reefs because many of you probably know some of them, right? So greater than 60% of them are in trouble. That's enough, right? So it, things are not great for coral reefs today. So the question is, can they recover? If we protect them and set them aside, can they recover? Does it matter? It does to some people. Right? Definitely does to some people. Is it possible? We actually don't really know that. Although we do see recovery in places that are well managed and protected. So we do see recovery in those places. So what, I don't know why this did this, but what are corals? I'm just going to give you a really quick uh, coral reef ecology lesson in about 30 seconds. Okay. So uh, corals are animals. Oh, look, this is funny. I'm going to just put it all up here. Whoops. Okay, so corals are a combination of algae, not really, it's really a protozoan, but we can think of it as an algae because it's a photosynthetic protozoan that lives inside the corals, and it's called zooxanthellae. If you ever see that on a Scrabble game, you know, that's, that's a good one. No. <laughs> zooxanthellae. So these live inside the tissues of coral animals, and they're photosynthesizing, so they are providing the corals with sugars. Okay, they're providing the corals with sugars. The corals, in turn, are providing their little internal friends there with, well, waste, okay? So they're basically going to the bathroom all over their algal friends. And this is important because on coral reefs, the, the water itself has very few nutrients in it, which is different than the waters we have here off our coast. So it's a nutrient-poor system for the most part. So this is its own little internal engine. 
I give you sugar, you give me poop kind of deal, right? And this fuels the system. And this actually does fuel the energy in a coral reef. It's very tightly cycled. It's very, very tightly cycled. There's not a lot of energy that just kind of goes out in the form of photosynthetic energy. It's tightly cycled in the corals. So corals, because of this, act like plants, kind of, because they're working to make their little zooxanthellae friends happy. And without their zooxanthellae, the corals will die. After sometimes about a month, we call this coral bleaching. So when the zooxanthellae leave, the corals turn white, because they are what give the corals their color. And then the corals begin to stress out, because they get about 90% of their food from these zooxanthellae. Um, so here's another important player on this. So because corals act like plants, kind of, they compete with algae. And algae likes nutrients in the water. So algae tend to be limited on coral reefs anyway, because remember I said there are not a lot of free nutrients in the water. But there are certain fish here, parrotfish, primary among them. We'll get back to him in a second, or her, well, it's him in this case. And surgeonfish and chub and damselfish, these are fish that are eating algae. So they're constantly like little vacuum cleaners, you know, on the reef, cleaning up the algae. And they open space for a type of coralline algae to settle on which corals can grow. So these fish are vacuuming out the reef and creating space for corals to grow. So you can enhance coral diversity. They're really important to the system. Well, they have their um, not so good friends too, and these are coral trout, but they're gonna be eating those herbivorous fish. And so there's a whole system here of who eats who, but here's the thing. If there's a diversity of these predators on the reef, this, this is gonna make sense in a minute, okay? Because it's gonna be about fishing, all right? So if there's a diversity of these predators on the reef, they will eat different kinds of herbivores. Those herbivores have a relatively fast reproductive rate. They will churn out babies in response to being eaten, right? So that's going to keep their reproductive rates up across a wide diversity of fish. You following me? So if I go fishing, and on the island of Woliai, there are 78 different documented types of fishing. Okay, 78. And what I mean by that is like a different size hook is called something different. A different type of line is called something different. A different kind of bait is called something different. A different depth that you fish at is called something different. And each of these types of fishing is targeting a different fish. So with all those different kinds of fishing, they're acting like these predators in a way. They're, they're hitting lots of different kinds of fish. Okay, you following me? So if we reduce the kind of fishing that we do to just a few different types, and this is happening out there, we're going to be putting pressure on fewer types of fish. And that's going to change the dynamics of the reef. Turns out generally for the bad. Okay, it turns out not to be so good for the reefs. Okay, so this is a really important role that people play, and they've been playing this role out there for many, many years. So when we talk about traditional people living in these places, we are not talking about traditional people keeping reefs pristine, whatever that word means anyway. They have an impact. Definitely they have an impact on their systems. But they keep those systems in, uh, providing for them, which is in a way keeping them diverse, right? So this is true of peoples that live in the Amazon, Pacific Northwest. You can go all over the place and look at, his, at, at native peoples that have been living in places for thousands of years. They shape those systems, but they keep those systems healthy in a way as well, providing for them. Does that make sense to you? You following that? Okay, so the diversity of ways that people do things is keeping their systems healthy. As we lose traditions in these cultures, we lose the diversity of the systems that they live in, actually. As cultural diversity goes, so too does ecological diversity. They are linked on our planet. And we've seen that decline. We've all seen that decline. And there's a lot of reasons why our environments are declining. But one of them, I'm here to tell you, is the decline of cultural systems that help to keep those intact. So what I'm proposing today, and what we're doing in the Outer Islands, is that we need to think more carefully about how we do conservation. Who is our partner? Who's at the table when we're planning conservation initiatives? Because ultimately, we all rely on the oceans. But our relationships with it may differ. Many of you may love the oceans. You may have a very close relationship with the ocean. But it's probably not putting dinner on your plate at the end of every day. 
Is it, a, is it a, a lesser relationship? Definitely not, but it's different, right? And your motivations for protecting it and the ways in which you might think we should do that might be very different than somebody who is living on the ocean. Okay, so um, what I'm proposing here is really a paradigm shift in the way we do conservation. We have always based our conservation on science. And I'm, I'm a scientist, so I'm not saying the science isn't important, right? But most of what we do is based on numbers, empirical evidence, data which defines success. Did this marine protected area work? Well, let's look at the numbers, right? Oh wait, there's people too, right? I forgot about them. So maybe we should be figuring out if it's actually working with the people. No, that's usually not considered in many cases. It's more about how the science is telling us how it works. So to involve people really does require a paradigm shift, and there are precious few examples of this in conservation planning today. I'm here to tell you that. So you might, you might be part of an organization even that says they do community-based conservation, and I'm sure many of them actually do, but a lot of those community-based conservation efforts and projects are kind of like this. I have the plan because I know what you need, so let me work with you as a community to teach you how to implement my plan, because it's a good one, trust me, you're going to like it. So this is the way we tend to do conservation. It is community-based. We're going to put education programs. We're going to give you pamphlets. We're going to give you educational handbooks to teach you how to do the monitoring. We're going to tell you why it's important. It's all good that way. We are working with the community. But the bottom line is that it's a plan that was preconceived around somebody's board table. And it's often not the case, in fact, I can tell you most of the time it's not the case, that the people in whose waters those plans will be implemented were not at that table most of the time. So it may be a good idea. We may want to put a marine protected area. Do they work? Yes. Empirical data show that marine protected areas are great. They work. They really do, scientifically. But they only work if they work. They only work if people stay out of them. They only work if the plan you put down is actually being implemented and enforced. And that's not always the case, because sometimes it causes hardship. Because you know what? If you need to go fishing to put food on your table, it's kind of tough to do when there's a no-take zone, right? OK, so here's a, this is a little graph here showing you that marine protected areas actually do work. So you see a, the park is the protected area. The non-park is not protected. The black bar is grazing intensity of all those parrotfish and all those algae-eating fish. And the gray bar is uh, the al algae cover itself. And you can see in the park, there's low algae and there's lots of grazers. So they're chowing down all that algae. Outside of the park, where there's fishing, there's probably a lot of herbivorous fish that are fished out of that system. So you see high algae cover and low numbers of those herbivorous fish. So definitely it's working, like scientifically, this particular park. Okay? So I'm going to read you this quote here because I think this is sort of central to the work that we're doing in the Outer Islands. We need to have a, this is, a, this is by Chief Ike. He's a chief on Asor Island, and, which is part of Ulithi Atoll. And Ike says to, he's, he's addressing his community. At this point, it's mostly at the men's house. So it's mostly men who are present. And he says to them, we need to have a common understanding around management so that everyone agrees and supports it. Understanding the old ways and the impacts of the new ways can help us protect the ocean for our children and for their children. So look at the first sentence here, though, because that's really telling to me. All right? we, we need to have a common understanding around management so that everyone agrees and supports it. He's not going to tell his community what to do, because he knows that isn't going to work. Instead, he's going to talk to them. They're going to come up with a plan, and they're all going to get behind it. And he's making a plea here that that happened. He's saying, please, we all need to support this. And the chiefs don't talk much, actually, at many of these meetings. They do a lot of listening which is, I think, something that we tend to do not quite enough of in many of our own lives. And uh, they li he listens to everybody. And then sometimes he'll, like, this is basically all he said, right? But it's pretty powerful, what he's saying to his people. And then he will, the people who are responsible for the fishing and responsible for doing these activities will themselves begin to carry out those plans. That's how it works in these communities. It's not the way we do conservation today, 